Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Gibson. I'm Director Curator of Gallery 1 CO3, which is the Campus Art Gallery of the University of Winnipeg. And it's my pleasure to organize Grace Nichols Artist Talk tonight in collaboration with the Manitoba Craft Council. I would like to begin this evening with a land acknowledgement. Gallery 1 CO3 is situated at the University of Winnipeg, which is on Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Métis Nation and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples. Our water is sourced from Shoal Lake, 40 First Nation. Gallery 1 CO3 promotes further understanding of territorial acknowledgements. And one way to begin this work is to visit native-land.ca, a resource to learn more about indigenous territories, languages, lands, and ways of life. So welcome to tonight's event in which we have the privilege of hearing established Winnipeg artist Grace Nichols speak about her work. Grace's talk is presented both as the inaugural event in Manitoba Craft Council's Year of EcoCraft, which MCC's director Tammy Sutherland will speak to shortly, and as a lead-in to Grace's much anticipated solo exhibition entitled Eruptions, which I'm thrilled to announce will open to visitors at Gallery 1 CO3 on February 17th. Tonight, Grace will offer an outline of her creative practice in ceramics, providing insight into the techniques and concepts that drive her work. Over the two years that I have been working with Grace to plan her exhibition, it's become abundantly clear that her practice is grounded in rigorous research and constant experimentation. Her virtuosic incorporation of diverse ceramic techniques is displayed in eruptions alongside forward-facing investigations, which demonstrate the transformative potential of the medium, such as experimentations in 3D printing with her collaborator, Michael Zayach. Conceptually, Grace's work is deeply meditative, continuously engaged with consideration of life cycles of living organisms and referencing ceramic traditions that stretch across time and space. Eruptions in particular considers how the struggle for survival on an individual level is reflected in the larger picture of the climate crisis that we're facing. I would like to offer my heartfelt thanks to Grace for sharing her work with us this evening and more broadly for the opportunity to present her work at Gallery 1 CO3. Grace has been exceedingly patient as her exhibition has been delayed numerous times due to the pandemic. I would also like to express my gratitude to Michael Zayach for the opportunity to show his inkjet prints of Grace's plumes pieces, excuse me, <laughs> um, each of which he photographed more than 50 times <laughs> to render into a 3D file, which he then printed. Michael has been invaluable to the realization of this show as he also installed and documented it with the utmost of attention to detail and care. My thanks also go out to Ian Lark for graphic design of the exhibition's promotional materials. And I'd like to thank and acknowledge that Eruptions has been made possible in part by funding from the Manitoba Arts Council, Conseil des Arts du Manitoba. So for tonight's event, I wish to thank the Manitoba Craft Council as well for co-sponsorship and in particular, Katrina Craig and her team for promotional efforts and Tammy Sutherland for bringing remarks this evening. Thanks to Evan and the University of uh, Winnipeg's Media Services for making sure the technology runs smoothly and to ASL interpreter Hannah Harrison, who's providing this valuable service of interpretation in a live format this evening. So please note that this event is being recorded and that the recording will be posted to Gallery 1 CO3 and Manitoba Craft Council's YouTube channels in approximately one week's time. There will be an opportunity for the audience to submit questions to Grace following her talk. And so for that purpose, I ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to do this. And uh, so now I'm going to unplug my telephone and um, I'm going to actually pass it over to Tammy Sutherland, the director of the Manitoba Craft Council to say a few words about the year of EcoCraft and to introduce Grace Nichol. So oh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to Gallery 1CO3 for inviting us to co-present this artist talk by Grace Nichol, a longtime member and one-time board member of the Manitoba Craft Council. For us, tonight's talk is part of Year of EcoCraft. We're dedicating our 2022 exhibition and programming schedule to engaging with what is arguably the biggest challenge facing our generation, climate change. 
Problem solving is really at the heart of craft. It's about taking the materials, tools, and skills we have at hand and tackling whatever comes our way. Craft is the ultimate multi-tool, the Swiss army knife of the artistic community, combining earthy functionality, sublime aesthetics, and conceptual rigor. Anchoring the year is a special collaboration. 11 craftspeople have been paired with 12 scientists to share research and create new work addressing climate change from a wide spectrum of perspectives. Some of the questions they're looking at include, what's the impact of climate change on Winnipeg's tree canopy? The province's bird populations and their migration patterns? The spread of invasive species in Lake Winnipeg? How do extreme weather events affect Northern communities? What are the impacts of agriculture on soil quality? And what of the possibilities inherent in localized textile production? These are just a few of some of the many issues participants are investigating. And an exhibition of their work uh, will premiere at the C2 Center for Craft uh, in September, October this year. In the meanwhile, you can watch MCC's social media or sign up for our Craft Blast emails to find out the latest news about talks, workshops, exhibitions, and other events uh, during this year of EcoCraft. So now I would like to go on and introduce Grace Nickel, who will be speaking to us tonight about her new exhibition. Grace Nickel, as many of you know, is an artist and educator living in Winnipeg. Her studio practice focuses on sculptural ceramics and installation. She's won awards in international competitions, including the Mino International Ceramics Competition in Japan and the Taiwan Ceramics Biennale. Solo exhibitions of her work have been presented across Canada. Her works are represented in numerous collections, including the Museum of Modern Ceramic Art in Gifu, Japan, the New Taipei City Yingge Ceramics Museum in Taiwan, and the Fool International Ceramic Art Museum's project in Fuping, China. She was also selected as part of the Chengju International Craft Biennale in Korea and at several Inseca annual exhibitions. She's completed residencies, engaged in research, and given lectures around the globe. She has a BFA from U of M and an MFA from NASCAD University and is a member of the Royal Canadian Academy of the Arts. She currently teaches as Associate Professor at the University of Manitoba School of Art. Over the course of her career, technical experimentation, conceptual refinement, and engagement with the contemporary craft community have been her hallmarks. Her reputation for painstaking research, persistence in exploring new territory, and exquisite craftsmanship have earned her the respect and recognition of colleagues, critics, and curators at an international, national, and local level. Tonight, we're pleased to learn more about your most recent body of work, Eruptions. So Grace, over to you. Thank you very much, Tammy. Lovely introduction. And um, thank you for organizing this uh, really important and uh, of course, current and topical uh, series of lectures. And I have to, of course, say thank you to Jennifer Gibson and all her hard work in um, finally bringing this uh, exhibition to the public, uh, opening February 17th, as she stated. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, organizing this lecture. So uh, I'm going to uh, dive in to the slides. Uh, starting uh, with the title page. And uh, this is uh, very close to where I grew up. I recently had a student say to me, uh, Grace, everything you make looks like winter. And I hadn't consciously thought of that before, but uh, every direction one turns in Southern Manitoba, uh, looks like this for nearly six months out of the year. And uh, what I was conscious of from a very early age was uh, actually the uh, scarcity of trees and how intentional every tree was and uh, how each tree 
was not to uh, be taken for granted because it, it had to be uh, planted. So anywhere you see a gathering of trees, a clump, uh, means there's some human life. And I uh, learned very early on to not um, think about trees as uh, something that I, you know, I, I could take lightly. And uh, I can't help but think that partially that has had an impact. Uh, I'm not one to really connect so directly my influences, early influences with the work I make, but I think there is something to it. So uh, I'm going to just give a little bit of background on the work I've done with uh, primarily devastated uh, tree forms working in porcelain. So uh, this is an installation uh, from 2008. It's called Devastatus Rememorari. And uh, not uh, in Manitoba, but uh, rather in Halifax, where uh, I lived for two years. Uh, I arrived there in 2006, and uh, three years before that, uh, Point Pleasant Park, which is a huge urban uh, forest in the southern part of the city, uh, had uh, experienced a hurricane, Hurricane Juan. Uh, it destroyed 70,000 trees. And um, I had been told before I moved there that I'd hardly even notice the destruction at this point and, um, or at that point. And I walked into the park and I, I knew almost immediately that I was going to have to um, make a tribute piece because uh, whoever told me that was, was wrong. And uh, it, it was uh, really quite shocking to see how much um, evidence there still was uh, of all the, the destruction. So I made this, and uh, this was shown in the Mary E. Black Gallery, uh, right next to NASCAD, where I was uh, studying and finishing up uh, my graduate studies. And uh, no, it's not snow on the ground, but it is salt, 400 pounds of road salt, which is something I became um, much more aware of in Halifax. Uh, as a, a means to combat uh, ice. But um, here I was thinking also of the salt that would have been um, uh, also devastating to the forest and um, the growth because uh, of course uh, it um, tends to inhibit and uh, destroy growth. So I decided I would go with the, the salt uh, for a floor which actually was in the shape of the hurricane's trajectory. So the hurricane hit September 28th, uh, 2003. And um, I actually uh, managed to find a newspaper from September 30th because uh, all the electricity was down, no cell phone service, but somehow they managed to actually publish a newspaper. So I used quite a lot of text on the surfaces of these branch forms. And the text is uh, a mix. This is my handwriting done in slip and then delicately uh, moved from a plaster bat uh, onto the clay surface. These are both um, porcelain as well. And on the left, there's uh, again, the words it's devastated and remembered or in Latin, devastatus and rememorari. And I just kept repeating those uh, words over and over again, uh, writing them in clay slip. The one on the left also has a little bit of a metallic uh, crown. And um, Tammy mentioned that loss of the tree canopy. So I do think a lot about um, that kind of, again, uh, loss of tree cover. And on the right, uh, you see also some text embedded and some um, texture added as well. I often use perlite in my slip, my clay slip, uh, which is used for uh, potting soil, but I use it because it, it imparts a really um, beautiful kind of texture. On the left, you can just very faintly see the words. It's just a sort of trace of devastated and remembered. On the right, those are actually excerpts from the newspaper I mentioned and I did a transfer uh, print of those onto the clay surface. 
So uh, I'm going to talk now about um, the kind of research I've been doing and have actually been doing for a long time, which often involves uh, photographing nature and uh, it's very a very close up view of nature, uh, particularly lately fungus. Although this was a, a photo sent to me by a good friend, Catherine Coop, and you'll see a few more of hers, her shots later. And um, this got me uh, thinking about uh, a new body of work now showing um, at Gallery 1 CO3, uh, this kind of uh, hollowing out of a tree as it ages. Uh, there's a lot of uh, metaphor I find between um, a tree and its life cycle and the human body. Uh, sometimes the destruction is also, of course, um, uh, human intervention uh, or animals, in fact. And here um, also a really beautiful uh, surface of drying mud, uh, which I relate to quite closely in terms of uh, being, of course, the very material I work with. And here the um, decaying bark and the mud are basically merging. And uh, I've been paying a lot of attention to these sorts of odd growths on trees, burls, or sometimes they're uh, galls. And uh, that's really where the idea of eruptions started. Also this, this kind of uh, shedding of a skin or skin loosening, almost like loose uh, or like loose clothing. And these, uh, these are hollowed out uh, logs that, you know, someone's gone into the forest and, and cut. And this is really common practice actually uh, for regeneration of a forest. Uh, and uh, it um, just speeds up that decomposition. And then that kind of um, also uh, reclaiming in a way uh, of the nutrients it can provide for a new uh, forest uh, floor. And um, in this case, I was really attracted to the green plus the snow, uh, very much pointing to our, um, the seasonal cycle that all of us really um, are part of. And this, this was actually, uh, these were both taken in Point Pleasant Park and uh, the tree on the left especially uh, stayed with me. And you'll see how that uh, sort of surfaced later in my work. It just looked, uh, it looked corpse-like to me. So I'm jumping ahead now because um, after um, Halifax and uh, when I finished up at, at NASCAD, um, shortly afterwards, I started uh, teaching at the University of Manitoba full time. So then, of course, I had access to facilities such as this called CAS, Center for Architectural Structures and Technology. It's actually part of the Faculty of Architecture. So I was quite interested in their uh, technology, fabric formwork that they had developed, and they were using it for uh, creating concrete structures, but I wanted to try it for uh, clay. And I started with just this plastic. A uh, piece of plastic fabric is what it is, and had these cut, and then this frame built, and uh, created a tube, and I hand sewed uh, the tube, and then um, stapled it at the top. So it's super low tech, but uh, I worked with uh, Ronnie Araya. He was the researcher at um, Cast at the time. And my idea was to fill these with plaster and then make molds. And I wanted to use a kind of malleable material for that. And he had this brilliant idea of uh, filling them with water first. And then we played around with altering the form while the water was in it uh, with rope. And uh, we had inserted a few sort of button-like forms that created knots. You can see on the left there, I have introduced the plaster and it's taken on sort of that uh, pretty um, fluid kind of organic uh, aesthetic. 
and I managed to keep the uh, the stitching, which I see as sutures really, and uh, also learned that hand stitching had way more character than when I tried mis machine stitching them. This is the mold I made, not the prettiest. I use uh, paper plaster, so I can make a much thinner mold and yet really strong, but it's something I can lift. And uh, that was the first piece. Uh, you can see that form at the bottom. So uh, my very first attempt there at uh, making a piece using the uh, fabric formwork technology. In the background is actually uh, a print and that's taken from um, one of my three-dimensional columns and kind of uh, taking the surface off of that and stretching it out. And um, it's, a, for me, uh, made me think of the practice of um, espalier in um, horticulture, where you're forcing nature to grow two-dimensionally, often used for confined spaces. So the idea here with this um, project was to, uh, instead of adding a lot of surface and embellishment, I wanted the very process of forming and making to inadvertently produce the surface as well. So I had an opportunity, uh, actually Michael and I went to Jingdezhen, China to the pottery workshop there. Uh, Jingdezhen is the imperial porcelain capital of China. There's a huge, of course, uh, tradition and a very long history of work, porcelain uh, production. And um, we stayed here first time for about a month. We've been several times. And uh, what I wanted to do is just push that fabric work a little bit more and just see how much uh, control I could exert or uh, not <laughs> exert if I chose that. So here I started to play around just with that really simple wooden frame and giving it a twist or two twists. And I wanted to keep that. I really thought the uh, sort of uh, folds were, were quite beautiful on the diagonal. So I splashed some plaster on it and then I filled that with plaster. So here I am uh, ripping off the fabric and I was using actually drapery uh, Chinese drapery fabrics. And that's how uh, the surface was imparted and then became completely integral to the form itself. And that was what I was um, aiming for uh, because I have spent many, many years uh, applying and um, embellishing a surface on a form. So this is the result. Ultimately, this was after another trip to China, to Jingdezhen. And this is called Arbor Vitae. Here you see it in our actual uh, contemporary gallery, which was on Ross Avenue in Winnipeg, but sadly uh, closed. Uh, mine was uh, one of the last shows, mine with uh, Ian August. And um, what, uh, what this is about, you'll see there's a piece on the floor it's called prone and uh that uh was uh definitely uh resonating with that uh that big dead uh tree i showed earlier in point pleasant park and then there's uh six um uh sentinels i'll call them uh guarding the prone tree here's a detail and this was made up of five sections. Each one is sitting on a kind of cradle, two cradles. And this is the exterior. I embedded a lot of sort of natural um, image, not natural matter um, imagery into that surface. I really like to think about the tree's history and um, just give it a little bit of what it, it would have had in the past in its life. And uh, I do make a lot of uh, molds from natural matter and uh, press clay into those and then embed them. But this, uh, what, this is what was happening in the interior. So this kind of interest in uh, fungus uh, had already begun. And I wanted here to make a, a kind of um, real uh, proliferation of growth within these hollowed out forms. Just uh, 
pointing at uh, a, bit, a little bit of hope in terms of how the fungus actually does lead to, to new life eventually. Uh, this was a separate piece called host, and it's really, um, I was thinking about a host tree or um, sometimes called a nursing tree or uh, the mother tree is what I've heard it referred to lately. And it has a more of a sort of upward uh, movement and uh, standing really, really tall. This is the crown I made for it. Obviously, there's a little bit of uh, a, you know, reference to an actual uh, regal uh, kind of headpiece. But in my case, uh, there's some leaves and the very top has some bony, bony plates. And uh, I do, uh, if I can, try to show my installations in different venues. I spend a lot of time on them. And uh, of course, uh, it's also uh, really interesting to see how the space and the architecture of the space, and in this case, the other work around it, uh, what impact does that have on the piece? So here it is in Portland, Oregon at Disjecta Contemporary Gallery. And this was the um, Enseca annual show in 2017. It's called the Evocative Garden. And uh, I'm jumping ahead now to um, what happened uh, post Arbor Vitae, uh, a, an opportunity to uh, spend a week, a one week residency, super intense at Teethlon 3D in Omaha, Nebraska. And um, it was just uh, Michael and myself, and uh, we worked with uh, two uh, technicians, uh, just one-on-one uh, -on -one the whole time. And uh, they devoted uh, an entire week of their time to us. Uh, this is where they put you up, this great mid-century modern uh, building. And there is uh, the Michael you've all been hearing about, <laughs> hanging out with uh, June uh, Kaneko Head. Uh, for the ceramic types in the crowd, June Kaneko, of course, very, very well known, uh, originally Jap from Japan, then uh, was teaching, I think, in the States, but has certainly lived in the States for a very long time. And he lives in Omaha, so you see his work everywhere. So uh, we worked in a, a big space across from that residence, and uh, uh, Tithon is known for its um, uh, research into uh, printing with clay. So this is actually a bed of stoneware you're seeing in a powder printer. We also played around with some uh, resin printing. Uh, this is porcelain. You see some little forms hanging upside down there. And uh, these are in fact uh, porcelain. It's called porcelite. Uh, they only have uh, proprietary materials, so you don't really learn a lot about them, but it is a business. And uh, Greg Pugh is the person who uh, has really taken the lead in creating um, clays specific to 3D printing. So these, uh, I'll just move through a little bit more quickly. Uh, you know, you need a lot of support. They're hanging upside down there and the, um, they're constantly dipped into this uh, uh, porcelain with resin in it. And we're trying to think about forms that would be really hard to make by hand. So these were based on seeds on uh, the right hand side. It was originally a cactus that was scanned, but it uh, looked a lot like that ginkgo leaf I had found outside <laughs> at this residency. And uh, we also uh, did some 3D printing using a wedge uh, I had found. It's a wedge of a tree somebody cut. I never, ever cut uh, trees down myself. And I actually don't alter uh, the fragments I find. I just use them as I find them. So here, uh, what we're working on is a mesh uh, to 3D print uh, this wedge. And this is how it starts. So it's a bed of stoneware. Uh, there's a nozzle that keeps going over, starting the printing. And they're really uh, just inkjet um, printer nozzles that have been converted, but uh, they're holding a binder. Again, uh, big secret as to what 
what's in that binder, but um, there were two little forms and this uh, wedge shape uh, with every layer, of course, you're going to get different patterns. In this case, it just happened to make a little happy face as well. And there they are, so uh, pretty powdery. And that's all extra uh, stoneware that then gets blasted off in the spray booth. And there are the finished forms. So the stoneware, it's actually, you know, kind of a buff color as they often are. Uh, these have all been bisked. Uh, some of them are uh, dipped into a, a white slip. And that's uh, what you can see on that uh, tree wedge. And, you know, again, this is something that would be pretty, pretty difficult, if not impossible to make by hand. But uh, once home, I wanted to mix it up a, a bit. So I started uh, seeing this wedge shape, uh, like a, a volcano almost, and uh, cut in these vents, vent holes. And that of course is where uh, typically plumes of smoke uh, or volcanic material, of course, um, would, would be, uh, emitted from. And I uh, kind of mixed up or mashed up these uh, growths that I uh, that are really informed by uh, the fungus and um, also mixed uh, together with this idea of, of plumes. And I even tried to incorporate a little bit of that support material into them. So um, this was my first attempt at <laughs> Uh, making these plumes. In the meantime, I was developing a whole new glaze palette and I have to thank Alexandra Ross, who was a student uh, at the university at, at the time. She won, a, uh, it was an undergraduate research award, which uh, meant she actually worked with me for an entire summer and uh, did a lot of the glaze testing. Uh, so thank you to Alexandra. And here I tried using the glazes on a piece for the first time. It's a mix of um, rare earth oxides for the color with some commercial stains. Then uh, this happened. And uh, again, um, I have to <laughs> mention Catherine Coop uh, because she sent me these photos. And uh, that's when uh, it all actually started to coalesce in terms of the work I was making for uh, eruptions. And uh, of course, fungus uh, growing on a dead log. And immediately, uh, I of course saw these as really, really beautiful coiled pots. And there's another view on the left there of vessels. And I started calling this um, vessel fungus. On the right, a really beautiful shot is also by Catherine Coop. And um, there you're seeing uh, a pattern in the bark that to me uh, looks like Morse code or you know some kind of message being sent. But uh, these, uh, really these photos started a whole uh, series of works I call pyres. And uh, pyre, of course, uh, traditionally a funeral pyre uh, where a, a wood is stacked up or some kind of combustible material, usually wood, uh, for um, burning a, a corpse, which is of course not a Western tradition. Uh, we would recoil at the thought of that, but I think um, it's really quite beautiful how it has, it's much more personalized in other cultures. We of course would uh, like to uh, hide all of that part of our reality. So that's what this form, this branch form is referring to. And I started making um, a lot of miniature coiled vessels. <laughs> Uh, again, the vessel fungus. And I'm also quite interested in grafting. So I put two parts together and put kind of a bandaid around the middle, but I was also thinking of, uh, if you live in Winnipeg, you'll be very familiar with tree banding. And um, the uh, vessels uh, also, uh, I think, um, resonate with a kind of seed pod. So, 
I used again transfer image techniques to um, transfer images of plants, flowers, again, just moving uh, ahead a little bit beyond uh, all of the decay and um, making my attempt to, to impart some hope. I also like to uh, re-bark the trees, kind of a, a way to reclaim or again, uh, say a little bit about the history of that living organism and uh, what it's lost, what it would have had in its past. And uh, yeah, I'm not ashamed to say that I often now actually uh, reference my own work. So that imagery is again coming from uh, other pieces I made. So there it is, uh, a finished piece, the first pyre with white vessels and a detail and a second pyre this time with bronze vessels so there's also um some uh a, a little bit of uh you know a feeling that there may be uh, almost like a boat uh a vessel in that sense as well in this case uh not really going anywhere it's lodged in the cross section uh, of another tree fragment i found again i i find uh them and use them the way they are. I make molds of them and then I start to alter them. I use this bronze glaze and um, have continued to, uh, I keep telling myself I'm going to stop, but it does relate to uh, the, the whole concept of commemoration. And of course, a, a lot of memorials are made of bronze. This is uh, a metallic glaze that I make myself. And uh, the 3D printing, uh, although very fascinating, uh, still, I think, um, for me at least, has a long, long path. And uh, a new project I'm working on is, is moving in that direction. But for uh, the eruptions show, I decided to go back to clay. I wanted to alter each one of these. Uh, I'm calling them volcanoes, and started uh, working uh, a little harder on those inserts. But I actually find these to be really awkward. These first ones, these are the first ones I made. And uh, it may sound strange, but that's actually, it felt like a bit of a victory because um, after working for many years, it, it's quite tempting to go back to the familiar, what you know is going to be successful. So it was a risk. And um, here, uh, this is the second uh, series. These are called eruptions. So it is the uh, uh, exhibition's namesake, the series and a close up. So again, I'm doing a lot of uh, miniature <laughs> uh, coiled vessels and another detail. And then this was uh, the third um, set, and I do show them as pairs, almost as if together they would make a whole. And um, you'll see here the uh, inserts, the plumes, uh, have become actually quite uh, refined and more sophisticated. Uh, so I stopped at that point. A detail. And then it was time to upscale those pyre forms. So uh, I went to Medalta, which uh, is in Medicine Hat, Alberta, the old historic Medalta Pottery is just a phenomenal uh, historic uh, facility. <clears throat> if you ever have a chance to go, uh, they of course um, used to use these beehive kilns. At one point, apparently 75% of all ceramics uh, dishes functional uh, ceramics in Canada came from here, and it actually uh, ran until 2010 when there was a really uh, huge flood. And um, sadly, they had actually just uh, roboticized everything. But uh, when the flood happened, they literally walked away. So everything's there for you to see. But they also started an international residency program, the Shaw International uh, Ceramic Residency. So here I am in uh, my temporary studio there, and I'm starting to make uh, 
a, a larger version of the pyres. Those first ones were really uh, the maquettes. And uh, here it has been bisked and glazed. So all those uh, really rich black parts are going to be bronze. And of course, everyone in ceramics knows you have to have a really good imagination for the medium because you have to have faith that that is in fact going to um, be bronze afterwards. And uh, there it is in the kiln. So I knew they had a, a large oval kiln there and I made the pieces to fit. And you can see um, this, I'm going to say, if any of my students are listening, please make a shrink slab, clay slab underneath so that the whole piece can move easily, especially across those um, uh, cracks in the, the shelves, between the shelves. So a little bit of support. And I always put in a few um, test tiles also a cone pack that actually is visible through the peepholes in the kiln. So there it is, finished. And this one's called uh, Pyre with Tumble Stack. And I was thinking about the tradition of pit firing. Uh, all of these pieces also uh, do have a reference to ceramic uh, art history. And uh, here there's a tumble stack of vessels in a pit, which really uh, just means you're stacking the vessels one on top of each other, no shelves, nothing formal like that, and firing them. Then it was time for the second piece. This is pyre with flower brick. Flower brick's also a very traditional um, form in ceramics. Uh, usually uh, there's a kind of lattice uh, format that, uh, you know, there's uh, an aperture for each flower. Uh, so I was thinking about that with this, and these, again, do refer also to uh, funerary rites, in this case, of course, the giving of flowers. And I made these uh, pots with uh, floral prints. And uh, you see that uh, sort of ragged paper hanging off. I also had a kind of what I thought of as... Um, a runner or a little maybe tablecloth for each of these pieces. Uh, so what's happening there is this is mid transfer. So that's how I transfer these images onto the uh, still wet clay. And there's a good example of one. And uh, if anyone's thinking of going to Medalta, this is where you stay in uh, the still relatively new artist lodge. So uh, this was the headquarters of IXL Industries, uh, the brick and tile, um, or tile and brick factory uh, at Medalta. So in this, uh, this residence, uh, they've tried to use almost every kind of brick that was produced here. Um, this was in my uh, room and I reduced it down to this, a black and white uh, photocopy. And there you see it's been transferred. So I also like to, whenever I uh, travel, just uh, put something in there that's of the place. And uh, there it is fired. So you can see the flowers are somewhat distressed and a little bit uh, maybe burnt looking, given that these are pyre forms. So these are commemorative pieces for uh, Certainly the uh, tree itself. Uh, and I wasn't even at this point thinking so consciously of climate change, although it was certainly becoming uh, a lot more um, topical. This parched dry earth, I find it interesting that in retrospect, all of these now have uh, really much, much greater resonance in terms of environment and uh, catastrophes and threats. So there, again, I've used that uh, really uh, heavy duty cracked earth kind of image. And then I wanted to do a third one. Uh, this one is pyre with amphoras. And in this case, uh, there's a lot of um, sort of layers of the tablecloth. I'm just looking at the time, so I'm gonna move a little more quickly, but I was thinking more of a sort of the formality. Um, I just remember uh, in the past, 
when um, guests were coming, my mother would, uh, for some reason, lay her about three or so tablecloths. And um, I never really quite understood why, but I knew that it meant uh, company was coming and something special was up. So these are amphoras, and I'm thinking here of uh, some nourishment for the, the afterlife. And finished. So that brings me to the first showing of eruptions. And that took place at uh, the Art Gallery of Burlington, uh, Burlington, Ontario. And uh, I'll just move through these slides. Uh, I'll say a little bit about this iteration, because uh, you'll see that um, there was some evolution. Uh, sort of this is this is actually pre pandemic 2019. Uh, the show is up from uh, August until October. So no one had any clue what was coming. Uh, certainly we were, uh, of course, well aware at that point of our climate crisis and how it wasn't uh, any longer way out there in the distance, but we were feeling the, the immediate effects. So the pyres for me, uh, again, they do uh, commemorate um, the environment, nature, and they also stand in as a metaphor for the body and the uh, aging of the body. But uh, also the idea that they are in fact logs that would fuel uh, a pyre uh, traditionally. So they provide their own fuel. And then through the fire, of course, they do um, create their own uh, permanent uh, memorials. So you see there's a, a lifeline attached to that one in the center. Uh, and I was thinking about uh, roots at first, how to make a root-like system. Uh, you can see that it actually emerges out of that tree form. And in the end, though, um, this group, uh, their beads strung together, ended up looking a little bit more intestinal. Uh, somehow some people see bones, uh, some people have even thought of it sort of as an umbilical cord. And one more close up. And I have to thank uh, Jacoby Heinrichs here, a uh, student at the time, uh, who helped uh, with uh, the casting. I made molds for all of these. And uh, he spent many hours casting hundreds of these forms and then I, I altered each one and the eruptions. So I'll just quickly mention the plinths. Uh, those are custom made. Uh, I wanted a certain type of plinth, almost uh, maybe somewhat clinical. And um, I was very happy uh, with someone in uh, Toronto uh, who did a fabulous job of those. So this I'm going to talk about briefly um, because uh, it's really uh, Michael's area. Uh, he often comes in where I leave off. So here he uh, was uh, making a 3D model of one of my plume forms. And uh, here it's not quite finished, but getting there. And this was another interim step. And um, these are moving towards being 3D printed. And uh, I find often the permutations along the way are, are really uh, beautiful, they're interesting. And I always check with him because of course, uh, you know, with not uh, being as savvy digitally, uh, I know that things can sometimes be cliche or hackneyed. So I just make sure that uh, they aren't. <laughs> and in this case, um, I definitely got, got the go ahead from him because uh, I really uh, was, was hoping I could impart something that would be the antidote to the uh, earth equality of all the other work in the show. So these are inkjet prints. I'm going to go through a series. Uh, I named them each one uh, and I chose the colors and each one is actually named after uh, one of the ceramic materials I used in the show. This is erbium plume, uh, Priseodymium plume. Those are both rare earth oxides. Kaolin plume, of course, a really, uh, major material in the porcelain itself. Uh, tangerine plume, a uh, mix of uh, rare earth oxide and some commercial stain. Uh, robin's egg blue, 
just because I really like that uh, commercial stain. And uh, neodymium, also a rare earth oxide. And then finally, the manganese plume, uh, which uh, relates to my bronze glaze. That's the main ingredient in my bronze glaze. So uh, this was the end result uh, of the uh, 3D model making its 3D printed bronze. And um, that actually is uh, informing a new body of work, uh, which I'm not going to talk about right now. Uh, I do wanna move through the slides. And um, one thing that did happen uh, after, uh, of course, the pandemic started, and I knew that uh, I was going to be showing the work again in Gallery 1CO3, uh, but of course it was postponed for an entire year. Uh, and that actually gave me a chance to um, augment uh, eruptions. And uh, with the pandemic, I absolutely knew that every pyre needed its own lifeline. So uh, the bead making process started again, and I have to now thank um, both PJ Anderson, one of our current MFA students at the U of M, and uh, Juliana Svirtsiedlowska Reimer, who has just finished her MFA program at the University of Manitoba, uh, for helping me make hundreds and hundreds of beads to create uh, two new lifelines. And uh, thanks again to PJ Anderson. Uh, I even had uh, an opportunity to do some black firing and uh, some of these are sawdust fired. So these were all incorporated into the new iteration of eruptions, eruptions Mach 2, I could call it. Uh, one uh, lone person managed to see the show at Gallery 1CO3 uh, I believe a student of um, working with Jennifer and uh, there it is installed by Michael Zayich. And um, I think uh, the space is, is really uh, complimentary. The, the shiny black floor I find especially sets off the work beautifully. And uh, there's the three pyres now up uh, the pyre with flower brick has its own uh, life support system after the pandemic started of course it was hard not to think of this as uh, a little bit more medical even more so now maybe uh, certainly still concerned for uh, planet earth but uh, you know there was really a, a turnaround in terms of trying to save ourselves and maybe now it's more um, humans at risk uh, because I think the planet will survive. So uh, these have been interpreted as branches. Um, I've had many different interpretations. The one on the right is all little uh, vessel forms. One on the left, uh, a little bit more plant growth. Uh, and again, I tried to uh, individualize each one of these uh, separate beads. And the shadows on the walls, of course, become important as a, a a branching uh, dendritic kind of pattern. And uh, you see here, again, they all have uh, now a kind of lifeline emerging from them. Close up. One more close up. Lifeline uh, for the uh, pyre with tumble stack. And uh, thank you. That is it for my slides. And uh, just wanted to, of course, acknowledge photography by Michael, uh, Catherine, myself with the nature shots. And uh, of course, again, Jennifer, Tammy, and uh, my students, or former students. And of course, the uh, some support from uh, funders, Manitoba Arts Council, Canada Council, plus uh, certainly uh, some offerings from the University of Manitoba. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Grace. Oh, this has been fantastic to um, really get a sense of the trajectory of the work that you've been doing for, it seems, uh, well, 20 years. You've taken us, I feel, on a 20 year journey. It's, it's just incredible. I see PJ Anderson has said, that's amazing. Such a great series. Um, Thanks, yeah. PJ. <laughs> She helped. <laughs> it, it really, yes. And actually, um, you're emphasizing that, that uh, your work too has been um, collaborative with Michael, but um, also, um, you know, collaborative with the students. But the, the fact that uh, these, these students are learning so much from you as well, um, just fantastic uh, through, through your research. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope they are. <laughs> they still all speak to me, so I think that's a good sign. And I just, I, I do want to mention that uh, the university has actually implemented uh, a number of programs for students to assist and uh, learn research, work with researchers. And in the case of our um, MFA students, of course, the master's students are researchers themselves. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, I think it's a, again, of course, a, a real um, uh, luxury in a way to, to be here to have uh, access to space facilities, but yeah, working with the students, of course, um, is wonderful, and I, I am grateful. So, um, yeah, I really hope uh, people do have questions. I kind of blasted through that. I did not want to go past eight o'clock and I don't think I did. <laughs> I had my timer going. Yeah, you're right on time. And we've got a lot of comments actually coming in on the chat as well as some questions. So uh, let me see if I can keep up here. So Diana Thornycroft says, Grace is a rock star. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Uh, Juliana says, this is so great. I loved hearing about your art practice and everything you've done. It's amazing. And uh, Nora Kruvinsky says, thank you for this wonderful look into this incredible work and the fascinating processes involved in creating it. Um, Monique says, impressive and inspiring work. Uh, oh, Diana Thornycroft has a question. Has your practice, oops, there's so much happening. I'm, I'm trying to keep up here with the chat even. Uh, has your practice changed a lot because of your teaching, Diana asks. Wow, that is an excellent question, Diana. I will try to answer it because um, I, uh, I'm i not going to actually give you a definitive answer. So I'm going to talk around that a little bit because, you know, I will say for sure, without a doubt, I could not have made two new lifelines without uh, the student's assistance. Uh, PJ was uh, there, it was a, a one month program last summer. And uh, thanks to a research grant uh, I received, I could hire Juliana for a full six months. And, you know, in that way, yes, I'm going to say uh, definitely. In terms of the content, uh, that is harder, I think, to assess because um, you know, I've worked large for some time, many, many years actually, and I've never had a large studio. So um, I can say maybe in that sense, not as much. I have access of course now to facilities like uh, the CAS building, for instance, and that's, uh, that's been great. But um, yeah, so Diane, I'm gonna think about that a little bit more because yeah, I think that's a really, really important thing to think about. And uh, so I would say uh, yes, to some extent for sure. And uh, would I still have made this work? Would I have done all that traveling? Uh, I have to say, I think so. Yes, I think I would have, <laughs> but you know, um, could, uh, all of it have happened in, in a timely fashion. I think that's a big part of it. It's just what what it makes possible within a time frame. Mm. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Well, there's, lots, there's lots of comments and lots of questions here. So uh, Grace Boyd says, stunning as always, Grace, thank you so much for your for sharing your recent work and research. 
And Heidi Thanks. McKenzie, so by, uh, I want to preface this by actually letting everyone know that uh, there is a publication forthcoming in conjunction with Eruptions, with this exhibition, and uh, really grateful that Heidi McKenzie, uh, who is a ceramics artist and writer uh, based out of Toronto, uh, is actually going to be writing um, a, a contextual response to the exhibition. And so Heidi has said, thanks, Grace. I always learn something new. Question, I'm wondering about the tilt upwards at the joints in all three pyres. Anything specific that inspired that gesture of form? Ah, that's something that I also have wondered as well. So that is actually a really good question too, because um, yes, yes, I do definitely make a connection between these pieces and the body. So there is that sense of, um, a uh, neck, I'm going to call it, but also maybe somebody holding up, helping um, to uh, elevate, to lift. And um, I'm just seeing a little bit of the chat here, and I'm just going to connect this, Jennifer, if you don't mind, to Candace Ring's question, because it's a really good question. Uh, yes, the ceramic pillows, uh, definitely. And um, I don't know if you noticed at uh, Madalta, <laughs> Uh, there was this kind of support structure underneath that uh, totally made me think of that uh, in terms of uh, the tradition of um, a ceramic pillow, but more so in the kiln. And uh, it, it very much looked like with the props I was using there just to keep it up because it could actually drop in the firing. Um, so I was thinking about that. And then you'll see they each also have sort of a, a collar, some of them quite frilly. And uh, I do, again, uh, make that sort of crossover uh, to um, the human body with the pieces, the pyres in particular, but really all of the trees. So, you know, all of this, of course, relates to my own experience, that micro experience, but uh, hopefully works on a, a macro and more universal level as well. Great. Uh, Bill Younger has said, I really appreciate your inspirations from the natural environment. Are you considering other nature considerations? Oh, good question, Bill. Um, you know, I have spent an awful lot of time probably looking way too closely at uh, dead plant life. Uh, I sometimes feel like, and um, I think uh, they're called, uh, uh, it's like archaeo um, botanist, where you're studying uh, dead trees and fossilized plants. And um, I do seem to just have a, a natural propensity towards that. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely Bill, love to spend maybe three months or so in Hawaii, maybe from January to March sometime, <laughs> studying the plant life there. Uh, and I'm sort of kidding, but not because I, I'm also very interested in um, tropical uh, plants in particular and have spent some time in Taiwan. Uh, so, you know, maybe moving a little bit more so towards um, something colorful as I'm slowly reintroducing color into my work. <laughs> So I hope that answers your question, Bill, to some extent. Uh, Grace, actually, when you mentioned uh, wanting to be, you know, to go to Hawaii, what about in your other travels? Have you ever worked with organic materials then when you were in China or maybe in um, the Southern Hemisphere? Well, uh, yes, definitely, Jennifer, because uh, what I do uh, when I go away, uh, I do actually gather the plant life, but let's say you're in Australia, you cannot bring that home with you. Totally illegal. So what I do is I make molds of them. And they're very simple, uh, actually, uh, clay molds that I bisque. And um, that way, I can take it home with me. So yeah, definitely. Like I said, in the talk, I always try to sort of bring something of the place into my work. You know, all the travel, I almost removed those slides, thinking, well, what a carbon footprint, you know, there's now um, that consideration. But of course, you can do things closer to home. 
like Medalta. And um, I, I still feel it is important for artists to put themselves into new contexts if they can. And, um, you know, I am a Manitoban. Um, I've lived in Winnipeg now for a long time. I wasn't born here. I was born in Southern Manitoba, but uh, I have always said I can live in Winnipeg, but only if I can leave Winnipeg. <laughs> and uh, that is not to be really negative, but I, I do feel it's still really important um, uh, just to mix it up a bit. And, you know, because you cannot predict what's going to happen out there, what you're going to see, who you meet, what uh, you encounter, what the working conditions are. Uh, so, you know, I, I like to include those experiences because I think it's also very important for students to look ahead to that or recent grads if they aren't doing it already. So, uh, you know, again, some places are drivable and um, it's something that uh, has definitely informed my practice. Great, thank you. Um, I want to uh, just touch on a comment. Reba Stone has said, uh, it'll be great to be able to see the actual work. Your commitment to your work is amazing. Agreed. And constant experimentation, constant. It's, it never ends. You get a sense of, you know, it just keeps going and going and going. I want to just say that um, indeed the exhibition will be open uh, February 17th until March 25th. The gallery will be open weekdays between 12 and 4 p.m. But folks need to make an appointment to actually visit the exhibition at least 24 hours in advance. So if you go to Gallery 1CO3's website, you'll see right on our homepage, you can click on the image, uh, which is sort of a like a mini poster for the exhibition. And you will then find a link to click on to uh, book your appointment in advance. Uh, so gallery one co 3s URL um, is uwinnipeg.ca forward slash art dash gallery. And so again, the exhibition will be open by appointment weekdays 12 to 4 uh, between February 17th and March 20th. Fifth, with the exception, of course, of Louis Real Day. Um, a couple of folks here are actually asking, uh, what does come next? So Leandra Branson says, fantastic. Do you think you'll be continuing the Pyre series? Uh, where are you thinking of going next with this form? So that's one question. And then following that, Bonnie Marin says, I was wondering if you could touch on what your next project is. Amazing work, by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, the Pyres, um, I'm putting that on hold for a while. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, there wasn't always access to my studio at school. And I started uh, working uh, in my small downtown space, uh, making smaller works. So I've actually started a whole series of uh, cameos. They are commemorative pieces. Uh, at first, I was actually making them to, um, as a tribute to the horrible massacre that occurred in Portapic in Nova Scotia. And uh, I was making 22 of them. Uh, that was the plan. And uh, that was April of 2020, I believe. And um, there were so many disastrous events that occurred after that quite, you know, aside from the pandemic itself. So I, I couldn't separate anymore what I, I wanted to commemorate. So now they're going to be a little bit more um, of, of a general uh, commemoration of these really tumultuous times. Uh, so there will still be a whole series of the cameo forms that I'm thinking of uh, as portraits, really. Um, but uh, they will be combined with um, backdrops that are going to be uh, printed as well. I'm not going to give too much away, but uh, ultimately um, uh, the research project uh, I have received support for uh, is to work with Michael to ultimately 3D print a whole set of those cameos. And uh, that's sort of as far as um, I actually know right now for the, the next step. And, um, you know, will the pyres resurface? I don't know. 
uh, I, I actually have started thinking very differently about uh, my work and maybe more so about how I show the work and that it's not so finite, uh, that, you know, it's a more fluid kind of process that happens for the artist. And I think just because I've worked so long, almost a little bit of a circular uh, process more so when I used to think everything was going in one direction, one line. So, you know, things kind of um, come in and out of, of view, I'll say. And, um, you know, so I don't write anything off. And as I mentioned, I've been referencing my own uh, past work. And uh, that's often thanks to Michael because he is photographing everything through photogrammetry, which means there's a 3D capture and we can actually then uh, flatten it out if I want to make the um, image transfers or decals uh, have been made as well. So um, that's, uh, a, it's going to be a two year project at least. So that's what's up. Uh, I feel like I missed something there, Jennifer. Was there anything? So maybe? Jenny Kilpatrick asks uh, or comments, the beads must make beautiful sounds while being strung and hung. Any chance that sound will find its way into future work? Oh, thank you, Jimmy. I totally love that because yes, they really do. Especially uh, when I lose hold of uh, the monofilament they're strung on and they all go crashing down. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that could actually be really, really interesting, maybe. You could set up a fan in the gallery, Jennifer. <laughs> that kind of movement, I think, would would be super exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, maybe the the next uh, time I install this show, I've sort of landed on um, maybe somewhat arbitrarily, but I, I find after four different venues, I, I feel satisfied. And uh, hopefully, there's been communication with the work and different audiences in that way. Yeah, so thanks, Jimmy. Really great comment. And um, so now Susan Collette, um, and I can't recall if I actually read Susan's first comment, but then there's a follow-up question. So uh, first says, uh, thank you, Grace. That was so interesting to see the progression of your works and your thoughts since working with you in China in 2007. I'm intrigued <laughs> by those lifelines and look forward to the new work you mentioned. And then uh, do you work in a studio at the university or a private studio or both? Oh, hi, Susan. Thanks so much for coming. And everybody, I have to say thank you. You're all being extremely patient. Glad you didn't have to leave your homes. It's minus 30 here, but uh, hopefully you're warmer, Susan. And um, yes, I actually do have a space at the uh, university, which is where I am right now. It's half office half studio, uh, and I have kept a small space uh, downtown in Winnipeg, uh, called, it's called the Exchange District where my studio is. Susan's from uh, Toronto, an amazing artist. And um, uh, I um, have kept that because I find there's many times when this is actually not accessible. Uh, one thing you learn uh, in uh, university life is that, um, this just is not your own space. So uh, all sorts of things come up and uh, it's just always been um, comforting to know I have that small space downtown as well. But yeah, I, I have to say it's a bit of a luxury to have two spaces, certainly. And, you know, getting back uh, to Diana's question, I would say, um, you know, I, I do, in a way, I'm privileged in that. Um, I have space and access to facilities. And, you know, uh, also uh, not a lot of time to make work <laughs> along with the teaching, but there is a research, um, certainly a segment to, to what I do here at the university. So yeah, thanks, Susan, for your question. And um, so I think there's, I haven't seen any other questions. There's a lot of amazing comments and praise through the chat as well. Uh, maybe I'll give one more minute uh, for anyone else who wants to pose a question, but I'll read through the chat comments. So Linda Mullen says, really enjoyed your talk, the opportunity to finally see some of your work. Um, let's see. Oh, 
Kristen Abramson says, Grace, it's been wonderful to watch your work develop over the many years since we met at the Bounce Center years ago. Even then, your work had a distinct gentleness in its references to nature, which has gracefully continued to evolve into such an enormous variety of thought-provoking surfaces, forms, colors, and concepts. Nature provides such a bounty of subject matter and inspiration, and your work reflects that with such beautiful richness. Seeing your work is always as beautiful an experience as a walk through a glorious forest. Oh, how lovely. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. We're probably not going to mention the year we met at the Bad Center, but uh, it was uh, pivotal. I find actually as all the, the residencies uh, tend to be for me. But that one, uh, I'm just going to mention an aside, I finally learned how to make a decent plaster mold. When I started out, uh, mold making was, was not popular. So uh, yeah, a lot came out of that. And of course, certainly the people I met. So thanks for coming. And Monica Martinez, whose name I recognize, uh, is in attendance tonight and says, such a privilege to hear you speak about your work, the way the depth of your research merges with the sensitivity of your artistic expression is awe-inspiring. I agree, I agree. Oh, thanks, Monica. <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> Um, colleague Grace Han says, amazing work, Grace. We're so lucky to have you in our community. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Grace H. I think she's right next door to me, actually. Oh! <laughs> <Right now. laughs> wow. Yeah, we, we like it here. <laughs> Connie Chappelle, um, stalwart supporter of the arts in Winnipeg and a fellow artist, says, uh, totally amazing, Grace. Um, Suzanne, I can't read Suzanne's last name, I think maybe McLeod, so it's incredible, so organic. You're very humble when you explained to me your work. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. <laughs> um, and Aaron Leah Wheeler, amazing work, Grace. And um, Bill Younger, I really appreciate your inspirations from the natural environment. Um, right, we talked about his question. I know another colleague had written in, um, okay. Did you answer the question, Grace, about um, referencing the Tang Dynasty ceramics? And I, yes, you did. The, the oh, yeah, yeah, the Tang Dynasty. Yeah, that's that's really great. Thanks, Candice, There's so for many, that. I can't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Dominique Ray, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, beautiful and compelling work. I greatly appreciate the inventiveness you always bring to your practice. And with your collaboration with Michael and New Media. Yeah, so special. Mm, thank you. Special. Um, I think I, I probably still didn't catch all of the, the the lovely comments in the chat. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Michael actually has added epic talk. Almost time for a glass of wine. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, as you can tell, I've got my virtual background uh, in place here in the gallery. So I do hope that folks will be able to make an appointment if you're here in uh, Winnipeg on Treaty One territory to come and see the exhibition. But um, Grace, thank you so very much for sharing your work tonight. And uh, folks, this has been recorded, so we hope to have this talk up on both Gallery 1 CO3 and Manitoba Craft Council's YouTube uh, feeds, maybe in about a week or so. And I think I think that's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Grace. Thank, thank you, Evan. You. Thank you, Hannah, for your interpretation tonight. And thank you, Tammy, as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye Take for care, now. Bye-bye.